Okay, here we are. We're in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. I'll begin by just reading the first verse, and then we'll get into our study. We're looking at the theme, the lion is a lamb, and you'll see why uh, we say that in just a moment. But beginning at verse 1 and reading verse 1, Revelation chapter 5, John writes, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Sealed with seven seals. Over the history of man, there have been many who have attempted to become what would be called the ruler of the world. All you need to do is read your history, read your Bible, and you read of men like Nebuchadnezzar, men like Darius, Alexander the Great. You see the history of the Caesars of Rome. You can read concerning Genghis Khan and Napoleon, Stalin, Hitler, Mao. All of these men arose with such desires. Ultimately, a Satan-empowered ruler is going to rise. He will succeed to a great extent. We're going to see him as the Antichrist, and his rule will be short-lived because this man is doomed to failure. Now, these men were simply following the lead of the first rebel, Satan. Satan hungered for power. He desired to rule the earth. He wanted to be worshipped, the Bible tells us, as God. He rebelled. He desired to rise above the angelic host in order that he might be the one who is worshipped. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, in chapter 28, verse 15, God speaks to Satan, and he says, You were perfect in your ways from the days you were created, the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. You see, God knew his sinful plans, and the Bible tells us that God cast him out of heaven. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 records what are called the five I wills of Satan. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Satan's rebellion was exposed when he came to earth, and he tried to rule as a god. And we're going to see that in the end. He'll be revealed for what he truly is, and he will be judged. You see, there is only one who has the right to rule, and he's going to take back what belongs to him. And that man is Jesus Christ. He's the rightful ruler. He is the king. In Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet, he says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He's speaking of Jesus, Messiah. And so with this in mind, we continue our look at heaven. And Jesus, as we see, is the center of attention. Jesus is the center of attention, and that's what makes up true worship. You see, in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, it says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we're going to be seeing that as we go through chapter 5. Notice as we begin here in verse 1, it says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Note with me that, that God is holding a scroll. When it says, I saw in the right hand of him, there are commentators that say the proper reading of that is actually not that he's clenching it, but that he has an open hand and that this scroll is sitting on the palm of his hand. This is taking place before a number of witnesses. We saw in chapter 4, many of these witnesses. We have the 24 elders representing the raptured saints. We have the Spirit in his sevenfold glory, the four living creatures. A multitude of angels are before the one who sat on the throne. We looked at the majesty of the throne. It's described as awesome with diamonds and sardius in appearance, a rainbow like an emerald. From the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices. 
As John was looking, the living creatures and the elders were crying out praise to God. They were saying, He is holy, the Lord God Almighty, who is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. He created all things, and by His will they exist and were created. And John saw God on the throne and on His open right hand a scroll. Now speaks concerning his right hand. Notice that the right hand is a picture of power, privilege, and authority. In Exodus 15, verse 6, it says, Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In Psalm 16, verse 11, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So this is a picture of power, privilege, authority. But he's holding a scroll. And notice it's written inside and on the back. It's sealed, he says, with seven seals. A scroll is a book. It was made from what is called papyrus, which was a reed plant that grew in a marsh. Or it could be uh, made out of leather. Some of the scrolls of that day could be as long as 148 feet long. But normally they were around one foot long. And the scroll that he's holding is a legal document. Roman contracts were written on the inner pages and sealed with seven seals. Jews drew up title deeds that were folded, signed, sealed, and they had at least three witnesses. The scroll is the title deed of the earth, and it's given to Jesus. The book's theme is redemption, and Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with precious blood, the blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the scroll that we're looking at here in chapter 5, verse 1, is the title deed of the earth, forfeited through sin, as we see in the book of Genesis. It is similar to what is recorded in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 2, verses 9 and 10, where he said, I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me. Lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, I was... It was written on the front and back, written on it, were lamentations, mourning, and woe. It gives a detailed description of judgment, but it also reveals redemption through Christ. It describes how Jesus will regain what is rightfully his through the work of redemption. You see, when God created Adam, God gave him dominion. God gave him authority on earth. Genesis 1.26 says, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. In his fall, Satan came, usurped Adam's authority. He gained a foothold over the earth. He deceived Eve. He appropriated Adam's authority. He began to dominate. Satan spoke of this when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Remember in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, how it says the devil led him up to a high mountain, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. He said to him, I'll give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, Satan had the opportunity to dominate, and he desired worship, and he desired to rule. Satan is the influencer of all evil things, and the world system is under his power. In 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul called him the God of this age. Jesus spoke of this authority in John 14, 30, when he said, I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. And so he usurped authority, he deceived Eve, and in doing so, he usurped the authority Adam had. And so since the fall of Adam, God's creation is in the need of redemption. And the Bible teaches us very clearly that Jesus came to redeem the world out of the destructive hand of the enemy. He has the right of ownership by way of creation and especially by way of redemption. And so Re Revelation chapter 5 is a testimony of God's loving but costly redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. It reveals the immense value that God places on that which he created and that which he loves. Jesus gave a series of uh, parables in the book of Matthew in chapter 13, 
And in chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, he said it like this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The Lord God purchased us, gave everything he had to redeem us. And so it's a picture of redemption. Notice again that the scroll has seven seals. The seals are, on scrolls were intended to prevent what would be called unauthorized entry. And we're going to see that when these seals are broken, each one leads to escalating judgments. And so as this is taking place, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then, verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals. I saw a strong, that word strong speaks of power or might. I saw a mighty, a powerful angel, is what he's saying, proclaiming with a loud voice. This is an angel of importance, selected to make an announcement. This description, strong angel, is used two more times in chapter 10 as well as chapter 18. The angel proclaims with a loud voice, when he says he's proclaiming with a loud voice, that signifies urgency and concern. It's even a challenge. Because in verse 2 he asks, Who is worthy to open the scroll, loose its seals? Who is worthy? The word worthy speaks of being sufficient, who has sufficient value to open the scroll. And what you're hearing here with this mighty angel is a challenge. Is there anyone present who can do this? And if there is anyone who can Come forward and do it. Is there any angel, is there any elder worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? And I want you to see this for a moment. I want you to think about this. The cry is met with total silence. What we have seen in chapter 4 is thundering, lightning. We've seen an awesome spectacle. You've heard the elders, you've heard the the, the, the angels, all that's going on, it's thunderous. There's worship. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, power. You created all things. By your will they exist and were created. They said, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Many times we think of, of heaven as maybe a quiet place where people are floating around playing harps. But it was loud. And it's loud with the thunderous praise of voice after voice. Multitudes of multitudes of voices. And he cries out, is there anyone, is there anyone worthy to open the scroll, to loose its seals? And as that mighty angel makes that proclamation, heaven that has been thundering with worship suddenly becomes silent. No one in heaven has the authority or virtue to open let alone to even look at the scroll. Somebody wrote, the angels of heaven shrunk back, eyes lowered, unable to meet the challenge. Heaven is silent because there's no one who is worthy. How can earth be redeemed when no one in heaven is found worthy for this work? Who can take back what Adam gave up? What can be done to fix this broken planet? And John is standing there. Picture it in your mind's eye for a moment. Silent. No one is moving. No one in heaven. No one on earth. Nothing under earth. No one is able to open it. They can't even look at it in order to open it. They can't even open it to read its words. And what is his response when silence hits heaven? He says in verse 4, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll, to open and read it, or to even look at it. And I wept much. I told the Lord I don't want to get emotional. I was praying before service. Began. I said, God, I don't want to cry. I'm tired of it. Here we go. It touches me. I, 
I began to sob, not so much sob, to weep when I was reading this and preparing this study. It touches me that deeply. I wept much. His, his tender heart was breaking. Is earth to remain? In sin and sorrow. Will evil continue? Will oppression reign? Will sickness and death prevail? Will sorrow remain? Is there no future for us at all? Is there no hope? Is there no justice? Who wants to live in a world that remains like this? And even gets worse. There's so much pain. There's so much suffering. There's so much hate. There's so much violence. There's so much apathy. There's so much cruelty. There's such sorrow and disease. My son-in-law has COVID. Families. In lockdown, I have friends, many, who have gone through it. David Trujillo, who was here a while back, David has COVID. And you see this virus, and you see the pain, the fear that so many live under. You see people driving their cars with masks on. Stop it. <laughs> That's kind of, <laughs> I don't know. The world has gone a bit, a bit crazy in some ways, don't you think? It really has. And for people like me, many of you, We've seen a lot of pain in life. I've ministered to a lot of very hurting people. And I've seen a lot of loss in others' lives and in my own. Performed funerals for babies who've been stillborn. Ministered at the deathbed of elderly. Everything in between. Comforted a lot of people who've been broken and experienced the comfort of others when I have been. There is so much pain. There is so much suffering. And there's so much hate. So much sickness. Cruelty. Apathy. And John sees this. And his heart breaks. I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. I wept much. Look at all the pain. Who's going to open that? You see, his view of the world doesn't reject that there is good. But sorrows over what is not good. It's, it's that kind of view that provokes believers to live for Jesus Christ. It's, it's that understanding that there's a lot of pain and that there is a remedy. There's a lot of pain that causes us to be provoked to tell people about Jesus Christ. It's that kind of thing. When I got saved, I, 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 I just noticed yesterday that, that uh, December 27th this year, two days after Christmas, December 27th is a Sunday. I'll be celebrating my 50th anniversary of giving my heart to Christ with you on, on, a, on Sunday morning. I'm looking forward to that, but I, I remember what took place. I still haven't forgotten 50 years, and I haven't forgotten. I, don't, I never want to forget where I was, where my life was, and all that garbage that was going on, and the gratitude that I have lived with now for 50, almost 50 years 
of how Jesus saves. And, and, and yet, I know that the, the only message of hope that we have is the gospel. And, and when somebody sees the pain, listen, don't hide from it. When you see it, it ought to break your heart. But that is what God uses mightily to reach those who aren't saved. In Psalm 126, verse 6, it says, He who goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You go forth and you're weeping. There's a, there's a sorrow for the lost. There's a sorrow for the world. The world that is going to hell. A world filled with misery and sorrow and pain and fear. And, and, and John sees that world and, and, and he, he begins to weep. One of my commentators I use, a man by the name of Ellicott, said, the words, I wept much, can only be understood by those who have lived in great catastrophes of the church and entered with the fullest sympathy into her sufferings. Without tears, the revelation was not written. Neither can it, can it without tears be understood. And so he's weeping. But one of the elders, verse 5, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Do not weep. There is hope. God is about to take action, he's saying. Jesus is revealed in this passage as the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Notice it identifies him with the tribe of Judah, the people of Israel, their ruler. When Jacob, the, uh, uh, one of the uh, early, uh, church, uh, early fathers in, in uh, religious history, in Jewish history, when Jacob was giving a blessing to his sons, it says in Genesis chapter 49, verses 9 and 10, to Judah he was speaking, he said, you are a lion's cub. O oh, Judah, you return from the prey, my son, like a lion. He crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom, until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nation is his. The lion is a symbol for the tribe of Judah. Isaiah 11 verse 1 says, A shoot will come up from the root of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. This is the Messiah. You see, God gave a promise to King David uh, who was from the tribe of Judah. In 2 Samuel 7 12 it says, When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body. I will establish his kingdom. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, he said, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Jesus is the lion. And Jesus fulfills these prophecies in his second coming and his reign over his kingdom. And so he's speaking concerning this. And he says, It prevailed to open the scroll to loose its seven seals. And, but notice verse 6, I looked, behold, in the midst of the throne... And of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he speaks about the lion, but now he sees the lamb. I looked in the midst of the throne. There were 24 elders. They're forming a circle. There are four living beasts. They're before the throne. And the lamb is in the middle front of the throne. And he says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. But the lion of the tribe of Judah is a lamb. He was told the lion would open the seals. But looks and instead he sees a lamb. He saw a lamb. That word lamb in the Greek language is in what is called a diminutive. It speaks of a little or a small or actually even a pet lamb. What you have here is when he speaks of the lion, what you see is a lamb. A small, innocent powerless lamb. The power and majesty of Messiah is clothed in the image of a small lamb. This tells us that his power is actually manifested in what appears to be weakness. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 4, Paul said, though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. Weakness speaks of the fact that Jesus, while on earth, could suffer 
and die. But he sees a lamb. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Later on, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is a lamb. Notice in verse 6, there stood a lamb as though it had been slain. When it says there stood, that means to, just to stand, standing in the presence of others. But notice he says, as though it had been slain. John can see the wounds on Jesus. But he's standing. He sees the wounds as though he had been slain. But he's standing because he's alive. The wounds are intended to reveal that Jesus suffered and that he died. But now he's alive. It's not simply a, a lamb that is being glorified, but the suffering lamb that is being exalted. It's the crucified lamb that is the center of heaven's attention. It's the lamb who was slain that draws people and bring salvation. In John 12, 32, it says, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. You see, this is the reason why we preach the gospel. This is the reason why we proclaim a message of salvation. This is why we read through the Bible and we study books like this, so that we can see that in the midst of all that we endure and all the things that many suffer, there's still hope and there's still victory. There's still a reason and a purpose for us to continue on. And it's because Jesus overcame. It's because Jesus loves us. It's because he laid his life down for us. It's because he took upon himself our sin. It's because he gives to us his righteousness. And it's because he's prepared a place for us that when we close our eyes here, we get to see him there. And that's something that should cause our hearts to be overflowing with joy in the midst of the, the trouble, in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the pain, because we're just passing through. This earth is not our home. He is the one who is lifted up for us. You see, his prominence in heaven, he's there before the throne. He's ready to act as the judge. In Acts 10, 42, it says, He commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. In 2 Timothy 4, 1, Paul said, I charge you, therefore, before God the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And so he's speaking of the one who is really the judge, the one who laid his life down, who owns the earth. And John says that this lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Well, we know in Scripture, horns often represent power. And we know that the number seven is the number of completeness. In Psalm 92, verse 10, it says, You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured upon me. And what he's saying here is the lamb has complete power and total control. The seven eyes we already saw in chapter 1, verse 4, as well as chapter 3, verse 1, it speaks of them as the seven spirits of God. That speaks of his omniscience. He sees everything. He says that the seven spirits of God are sent out into all the earth. The Spirit of God has works that he performs throughout the world. In verse 7, then, it, then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He came and took the scroll. This reminds us of Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where Daniel said, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. When you're looking at power and you're looking at might, Jesus' power and authority don't last only four years lasts forever and it's complete and it's total 
And that's what he's speaking about. Jesus is moving, and he's moving to act as a judge. And notice he takes the scroll from the hand of the Father. Now in verse 8 it says, When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. And so they begin to worship and they sing. They sang a new song. And they speak concerning his worth. They bring forth their bowls of incense that represent the prayers of the saints. And they're singing to the Lamb. And notice they're singing this new song. It's the song of the redeemed. Now this is a picture of the church in heaven. It's the song of the redeemed. Angels are not redeemed. Angels, when they fell, remain fallen. The ones who did not fall uh, are not in need of redemption. Angels are not redeemed. It's human beings that are redeemed. And it's the, the song of the redeemed as we sing praises to God. Like it says in Psalm 7, verse 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. Or Psalm 33, verses 1 through 3, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with a heart. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. So worship and praise is something that is exuberant, and that's what they're doing. And they're beginning to worship and praise as they sing this new song, the song of the redeemed. And they say in verse 9, You are worthy. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals. You were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you made us kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth. The church is a priesthood. We don't need a priesthood. We are a priesthood. And we have Jesus, our high priest. And the church has a king, Jesus. And we will rule with him in his future kingdom. We're going to see this later in, in this book when we look at the millennial reign of Christ. But believers are called kings and priests. In eternity, we have perfect access as we worship and fellowship with our God. We have that relationship with him that we can look at him and worship him and praise him and have fellowship with him. And we do so because we come through the blood of Christ. We have access through the blood of Christ. I had opportunity years ago now, it's been a number of years, to go on a few occasions to, to what were called presidential briefings, meetings in, in, in the White House. And in order to get in to these briefings, we had to send information to the government. They had to vet us. Then we got to uh, you'd get to a stand, as, uh, like a, it's like a gazebo. You'd walk up and they have officers there. They have to go through all your passport and everything, all your information. You, have to, you go in another room once again. You go through a series of, of uh, entrances until you finally get into the room where the briefing is going to take place. And, uh, and then when the president comes out and all, you, you see him. And, and um, it's, it's just kind of it's just interesting because... As I was doing that, I couldn't help but think, you know what? All of this has to take place to look at a man, to hear him speak. But when, when I go to heaven, I don't have to go through all these briefings. I don't have to go through vetting. I've already been vetted. I have the blood of Christ washed me free of all my sin. I can stand before the throne of God and worship him and praise him. And, and that to me means a lot. It, re it really does. You see, we have access to God. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. God has done the work for us by sending his son Jesus to die on a cross. It's a very simple but not simplistic message. It's simple because even a child can learn it. It's not simplistic because it has depth to it. And when you come to realize the various things that God does in your life, from, from head to toe, all the changes and all the, all the blessings and all the things that he works in your life, 
When you begin to grow older in the Lord and begin to realize how much he saved you from. You see, when you first get saved, you may not realize what a wretch you were. But after a while, when you begin to draw closer to him, you see him the way he truly is. And when you begin to see him in more light, if you will, when you walk further into the light and you see him for what he is, you see more of your own darkness. And you begin to be aware of the things that he saved you from and how evil they really are and what it cost him. And when you begin to understand that, that's when you draw more and more into worship and and that's when you begin to see, indeed, he is worthy. That's how it happens. When you first get saved, you don't really understand how deeply you're a sinner. You don't understand how much it cost him. But as you have walked with him for a while and you begin to see yourself more clearly because the light shines more brightly and you begin to read your Bible and you begin to see the things that you've done, the things that he forgave you of, and then you begin to see the blessings that he's brought into your life, friends and family, a church, people who love you, and you see these things and you can't help but worth worship the Lord. You can't help it. You can't help but raise your hands and surrender to him and say, God, you're so good to me. Look at what you've done for me. Look at how you've blessed me. Lord, I love you so much. Thank you so much. You cannot help but do that. And that's what's going on. We are, we are uh, kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. That's hard to believe, but that's what he's saying to us. And as this has taken place, verse 11, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures, the elders. A number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. There are over 100 million saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing." And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, under the sea, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. The voices of the four living creatures, the 24 elders are added to those voices, are added a multitude of angels. There are over a hundred million angels praising Jesus. This tells me that heaven is filled with worship and is filled with song. And the worship and praise goes to the Lamb. In Hebrews 1, verse 6, it said, When God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And every creature which is in heaven, all creation, in the words, breaks forth in praise. And praise to God. Again, sometimes we look at heaven as a, a quiet place where you kind of meditate under a tree. And I suspect that it's going to be a lot more, there'll be a lot more activity than we can imagine. I expect that, that when we're before the Lord and we're raising our hands and worshiping him, there isn't going to be anybody saying, it's too loud in here. We had a lady in our church who was close to 90 our church was um, meeting in a small place in, in Ontario on Maple Street. It sat 470 people. And it was very, there was, it was very small. The, the ceiling was only like nine feet high. And so we had a little platform and we had, it was a small building. But this little old lady, she was, she was in her late 80s. She was a little old lady, would sit in the front row. And we had big old amplifiers and things. And, I, and you could almost see her wig flying off her head with the, <laughs> you know. And I remember that, you know. And I'd, I'd look, and there's this little lady with a big smile on her face. And I thought, our music is kind of loud for you, you know. So I asked about it. I knew her grandson. And I said, how's your grandma put up with it? It's so loud. He says, oh, she doesn't worry about it. She just turns her hearing aid off. Well, we won't be wearing any hearing aids. I suspect that in heaven, 
as you are beginning to worship, and you will, and you begin to praise, and you will, and you give the blessing and honor and glory and power to the Lord, that you, you will be full-throated. You will be loud as you can be because everything was left behind. All sorrow, all sickness, all suffering, all pain, all disappointment, all bad memories, all loss, all disease, it's gone, never to be thought of again. And God will wipe the tear from your eyes. And God will give you nothing but comfort and joy. For at the right hand of God, there is joy forevermore. Can you imagine that, guys? It isn't that far from now. Soon we shall hear that trumpet and that voice come up here and we will leave this all behind and we will see him face to face and we will worship him with our open hearts and full throats saying, God, you are worthy of all honor and praise and glory. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. Romans 8, 19 through 22 says, All creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from, decay, from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation itself is pictured as bringing worship, for he is worthy. Heaven is filled with worship and song and praise to Jesus. And John has seen this. And from a moment before, when his, vo his heart was broken and the tears were flowing, and he was told, weep not. And then, then this lion was presented to him who turns out to be the lamb who redeemed the earth. Now he sees nothing but joy because God has done it, because God is a loving and forgiving, and a God of all worship that we should be giving to him at all times. Our life should be filled with worship for Jesus Christ. We begin here because in heaven, that's what we'll be doing. And those who don't want to worship him here will not be worshiping him there. So what we do is we have bowed our knee to him, we have opened our hearts to him, and we have said to him, you are worthy of all honor and power and glory for you have redeemed us. You loved us. You laid your life down for us. And Jesus, we just want to tell you how worthy you are and how much we love you. Thank you, Jesus.